in. I can't get that far. <laughs> She's blocking the reflection off of a vehicle. <laughs> now you might just have to move. Uh, <laughs> so it is good to be here with you. And I was understand that there's a couple of folks in the church family who are a little concerned about what I'm presenting being a little different than people like Stephen Bohr and others present. I will tell you, I've become a friend of Stephen Bohr's over the last couple of years. And interesting thing has happened in Daniel 11 studies. The, we started out a five, five series, every, one every year, of a Daniel 11 conference in Berrien Springs. We started out with four basic viewpoints on Daniel 11. And the church doesn't endorse, it does not endorse any of the viewpoints as the viewpoint of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So they're all four legit as far as that goes, OK? After five years, the chair of that group, of uh, the steering committee, a guy by the name of Conrad Vine, and uh, another great friend of mine, Conrad and I did not see the King of the South the same. He sees it as atheism, I see it as Islam. But we're great friends and we've been working together on this Daniel 11 conference year after year. And I got to present a unity viewpoint in the last Daniel 11 conference. And if you went to the Daniel11prophecy.com website where there that is, you'd actually get to watch it if you want. Afterwards, in the panel discussion, Conrad Vine said, five years ago, we began with four viewpoints. We're down to two. And that's because the rest of them all had issues with the text the deeper we got into the Hebrew over the years. It left the, what would be called the Islam as the king of the south and atheism as the king of the south viewpoints. He said, and after the last presentation, which is the one I had just made, he said, I think we're down to one and a half. <laughs> so five years, you come from four viewpoints down to one and a half, meaning those last two are beginning to merge, which is an exciting process. Now, Stephen Bohr wasn't there. But Stephen and I had lunch together in August. And at that time, he was under heavy fire from the Potomac Conference, and I was supporting him in that one. And, uh, and we got talking about Daniel 11, and he was very interested in what he missed. And there's others, like this former speaker of... It is written Canada that works together with Mark Finley, who are now very excited about the possibility of this stuff coming together. What it simply is, is the king of the north gets an ally in Revelation 13, the United States. Papacy and the United States working together. In Revelation 11, the Daniel 11 king of the south gets its ally out of the French Revolution. In other words, it's not atheism, or Islam, it is both. Just like it is both the United States and the papacy working together as the King of the North Alliance. In other words, we don't need to argue anymore about which one's right. They fit together. And I can demonstrate it from the text and the history and in what's going on all over the world at this very moment. And so we're getting a drawing together. And if you have concerns about that, please feel free to connect with me. I'd happily, I'm going to do a bunch of visitation uh, Sunday and maybe even this afternoon if somebody has a question on that and I can show you how the viewpoints fit together and you can relax and invite your friends. Because it is really time to invite friends. Um, let's just see something. Not cooperating, but that's okay. Maybe. Smartphones are not always 
especially when you're in front of an audience. Anyway, uh, this morning in Israel, at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, they were attacked. There are about a thousand injured, a hundred wounded, I mean a hundred killed. They were attacked by land, by sea, and by air, with 5,000 missiles on top of that. They have declared war against radical Islam, Hamas, etc. And Iran is celebrating the attacks. And if you take a look at this brochure, it says Islam and Christianity and political chaos and prophecy. If you go down to the headlines right under it on the Drudge Report that I was going to read to you, but it just decided to load another article and disappear on me. <laughs> and uh, Drudge Report's just a conglomerate of world headlines. The leading one right now, Israel at war. But under those headlines, it has a section about the chaos in US prof, uh, politics. Now, something that just made me laugh. You know, Alexa, artificial intelligence kind of thing, right? From Amazon. Alexa is saying the 2020 election was stolen. In the middle of all this, artificial intelligence decides they get involved. More chaos. <laughs> uh, and it's just a whole section on that. What I'm telling you is, that's exactly what Daniel 11 is describing for the time of the end. And when you unite the Islam and atheism viewpoints, they attack papal and Christianity in their allies, and the counterattack overwhelms and takes us into the coming of Christ. We are in the push as the counterattack hits. And we can track this in prophecy. We're exceedingly close. And I didn't encourage you strongly, grab some of these brochures, go invite your friends, and just let them know this speaker is going to be explaining how this is happening in front of our noses. Ellen White says the loud cry will happen while the events are happening in front of us. In other words, people don't wake up until it's right there in front of them. She also says, talking about Daniel 11, that there is a great increase in understanding that will happen just before the close of this Earth's history. Let's see. If you now add these two viewpoints, it creates a great increase of information while it's happening in front of us. That doesn't guarantee that I'm right, folks. But it does mean you should pay attention and check it to God's word to see if I am. All right? Be here in the evenings. I'm not going to keep going on Daniel 11 right now, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to encourage you to get out there while people are asking questions is when they're asking questions is when they're open to the answers. All right? Don't miss the opportunity that the world situation just gave us. Now, losing to win. God doesn't work in the same way we work. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, he doesn't do things our way. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So don't be surprised if God has alternative ways of working things out. All right? And that you're going to be left scratching your head and going, you, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. This can't be the way you want to do things. Oh, yeah, that's the way God works. I mean, he flat out told us, so don't be surprised with it. Back to Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. So does God have good intentions for you? Yes. 
Okay, hang on. Just think of the context here. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. They weren't searching for him with all their heart yet. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. God is sending them in the captivity to get their attention. Oh, captivity is a part of I have a future for you? Uh-huh. Because he's got to put them in that captivity before they're ready for his future. He's got to take them down to bring them up. Uh, continuing. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. So God's telling them, I care about you. I have a future and a hope for you. But that's going to take you through a captivity to get there. Ooh. Losing is winning when it turns you around. And think about that in your own life. We've got to keep that in mind. Jesus says the same thing. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. We've got to be prepared to lose to win. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have to be ready to lose to win. How many times when you feel like everything's falling apart, are you saying, thank you, Lord, for helping me win? I mean, I'm talking about a revolutionary way of thinking. In other words, praising the Lord even when stuff goes bad because it's going to work out. Because he's in charge. Now, Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You never win until you admit you're a loser. Until you admit you're a sinner, you're never going to have the gift of life, are you? Amen. So losing is winning if it turns you around. Hmm. It, does this really work in life? Yeah. Hey, take a look at what Ellen White said. The greater the distance between himself and Christ and the more inadequate his conceptions of the divine character and requirements, the more righteous he appears in his own eyes. Have you ever met anybody who claims they've quit sinning? Everyone I've ever met, and I've met a couple of them, not a lot, but a couple of them, they're all very proud of the fact that they're no longer sinning. By the way, pride is a sin. <laughs> They are pretty sure about their own righteousness. When I think about this quote, it tells me if they're sure about their own righteousness, they're a long ways from Jesus Christ. Because the more you see of Jesus, the more you realize how awful you really are. Because you start realizing even the good things you do are tainted with selfishness. The closer you are to Jesus the more you're going to feel like a loser in your own right, but because you're with him, you're a winner. That's interesting, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to take you to Hagerstown, Maryland. A church divided over a building program. Uh, I got the invitation, the pastor of the Hagerstown Church. I didn't know it was divided over the building program. They told me they were united on it during the interview. Churches don't always give a good uh, the truth to the pastor during the interview. And uh, so we came in, but they did tell me that they were a divided church, but it was over other things. And I found out one of those divisions was the building program. They had a church on a four-lane highway in town, and it was a divided highway, and they were right on it. They had parking spots for 20 to 30 cars, membership of 300. Do the math. Uh, we got a problem. 
Four-lane divided highway out front, no parking signs as far as you could see either way to make sure none of our members parked along that highway. Thankfully, our neighbor had some land that was mowed beside our place, and he didn't care if we mowed it and we parked on it. And there was a shopping plaza just up the hill from us, and we could go park in the shopping plaza parking lot. That's how we operated this little church. Oh, little church, a uh, couple hundred in attendance. Uh, we had, they had already bought five acres across from the junior college to build a new church. After I got there, I found out, mm, the church was very divided on whether or not to sell the church and move. Church was now for sale, but nobody was buying it, which is making those that are opposed to a building program really dig in their heels and say, see, the Lord doesn't want to sell it. The problem of it is nobody wanted a church on less than half an acre of land with 20 to 30 parking spots. We were hoping somebody would buy it for something else, but nobody was buying. I can remember the night right before going on vacation. I parked in the church parking lot late at night, late, somewhere around 10 o'clock or after. And I prayed, and I prayed, and Lord, what do you want us to do? It's not selling. Are you telling us to stay put and remodel to try and make this usable? Maybe we could get the neighbor's building. There's just a little alleyway and a neighbor. We could fill in between it, use their parking spots, and expand into that other building. What are you telling us? got out of my car after a while, and I came in a little back door through the pastor's office, and I came out, and there's the, the organ was over here, and the piano there, and I, I walked through the sanctuary without turning on a light, back into the foyer, got something I needed, came back out around the organ, through my office, and out the back door. Keep that route in mind. I went home and went to bed. About one o'clock in the morning, my phone rang. Hello? Are you the pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yes. Your church is on fire. Click. I'm just wondering, OK, I want to go to sleep. We're going on vacation. I need sleep before I drive. This is probably a prank call. I'm sitting there trying to decide, is this a prank call or not? My phone rang. Hello? This is my head elder. He said, I just got a call from the police department. It said the church is on fire. I said, yeah, it probably is. <laughs> said, I just got a strange phone call too, but it wasn't from an authority. <laughs> and... Uh, said, I'll, I'll see you there. So I got up and I put on kind of a business casual shirt and nice pants. And, and my wife says, why are you getting dressed up? I said, well, starters, if it's a real fire, I won't be back for a long time. If it's not a real fire, it doesn't matter. I just got to be ready for the real thing. I started driving towards the church. It was about five miles away. I got about halfway there, and I can see a glow on the sky. Oh, you know what I'm praying? Lord, I want this to be a really small fire or a really big fire. Please, no medium fire. <laughs> Why is that? Insurance. If you have a small fire, they're going to make you rebuild it. I mean, a small fire, it's not too hard. You can rebuild and you just spit things up. It's not so bad. A medium-sized fire, it's a long rebuilding program on the old spot. If it's a big fire, your move is now in process. I'm praying, Lord, make it a little, very small or very big, and preferably a really big one. Yeah, that's what my prayer life was like on the way to the church. I got to the four-lane highway. It's blocked all four lanes, both directions. 
I parked my car and started walking. It's like spaghetti factory. The hose is coming in from everywhere. And I get to an area of, they've already got the, you know, crime scene kind of tape out. I duck under it and go on inside the area where there are just firemen inside. And uh, as I'm walking in to that area, the fire breaks through the roof. Lord, keep it going. <laughs> and they have, well, they had this water cannon. This is out of the newspaper. I didn't have a camera with me. That water cannon was blasting in a window at the end of the church and where it's breaking out of the ceiling, and he had a chance of stopping the fire. And if he did, it was already past little and it wasn't big enough yet. And believe it or not, I said, Lord, could you cause him some trouble? <laughs> and all of a sudden, his water cannon quit. And they lowered it down to the ground, and they went to take a part off to put another one on, and the, and the wrenches were, I mean, they were having trouble. It was frozen up somehow. So they get a power hacksaw, <laughs> just cut through the thing and put it on a whole new unit. And they're having all this trouble for a while, and I thank you, Lord. Meanwhile, the building fire is moving through the attic, taking out the roof. Hmm. And... Uh, as I'm praying, they started questioning me. Had I ever said anything to the effect that a fire wouldn't hurt us? I said, yeah, I have. I've learned a long time ago when you're in trouble, you don't mess around, you tell the truth. When? I couldn't remember. I literally went blank on when I'd said it. It took me several weeks to remember. It was a couple of months earlier when the Moonies got really mad at me for interrupting one of their events by sharing the gospel. And they said, you don't know who you're messing with. You could lose your church building. And I said, go ahead and make our day. See the for sale sign out front? <laughs> this is just three months later, and it's now gone. It's on fire. <laughs> but it took me a while to remember who it was because hey, how could you say it? You know, it just frees up. I now... Re I now know repressed memories are a real thing. It took me three months. And then once I got it, they knew somebody else to investigate because it does end up being an arson fire. Uh, the fire swept... Oh, they got that fire um, water cannon back up there. But just as they were raising it, the air horns went off all the way on all the tr fire trucks. I didn't know what that meant. I do now. It's their warning to all the firemen to get out of the building. They've given up on the building. They're just going to contain it to this site and try and keep it from getting too hot. And only then was the water cannon able to get back in operation. That was interesting. Uh, that stained glass window up the front had a picture of Jesus with his hands out and the sheep around him as the good shepherd. And this, they took this picture I, as I watched it happen. The, this is now the opposite end of the church and the fire is burning in the balcony. Just as that water hose comes down and blows the picture of Jesus totally out, leaving only his two hands left. <sighs> And the PA system was in the balcony right behind that window, and we found parts of the PA system on the platform on the opposite end of the church as the water hose blew them to the other end of the building. Um, but anyway, fire destroys church. They kept everybody out of the building as they did their fire investigation, and they discovered it was an arson fire. When they finally allowed us to come back inside, they were pulling, well, 
This will give you an idea of what it was like inside. Um, there was no roof up there. There was twisted steel beams. And where the suspended roof was, there's little bits of it, but really that's the roof and the attic and anything in the attic is burned and dropped into the sanctuary. You look up there, you can see a tarp over the organ with about this much debris on top of it. And the same was there for the piano. They said, we believe we saved your pipe organ because the console was covered, but the problem is a burning roof had gone through the pipe chamber. <laughs> that was gone. <laughs> The building was considered a total loss by insurance. The walls were bowed out as the roof came down. As they were pulling the fireproof tarp off, I was standing there with the firemen as they were pulling it off. And I see a paper bag on the organ bench. And I thought, what's that? And I picked up the organ bench, I mean the paper bag, and I looked in it. There was a pack of Marlboro cigarettes, a fishing map of West Virginia, some partially eaten pizza, a little cassette tape recorder, and a Guns N' Roses death and destruction tape. I set it back down, and there's this clean spot where the bag has been, and everything else is smoke covered on the bench. By throwing this fireproof tarp over the organ, they just saved the evidence from the arsonist. But I already know that I am the prime suspect. I was the last known person in the building before the fire. I've already admitted that I've said that a fire wouldn't hurt us. And I now have my fingerprints on the bag. But I know I didn't put it there. I looked at the fireman. I said, call your fire marshal back. That bag belongs to your arsonist. Boy, he came back. And he was like a kid in a candy factory. You didn't even need to dust for prints. Somebody eats pizza and touch the smooth cover of a cassette tape. I can see the fingerprints without dusting. When I left to leave the church, there's a newspaper reporter standing outside. He says, what's going on in there? I said, hi, Mark. <laughs> I can't tell you. He said, what do you mean I can't tell you? I said, Mark, I can't tell you. Talk to the fire marshal. He says, I got it. He'd done stories on me before when the Moonies got mad at us. It made the front store pages of the newspaper on that, too, on that fight. So I said, you'll just have to talk to fire marshal. And he let me go. And he stood there waiting for the fire marshal to come out. <laughs> it was rather interesting. The things that happen, I'm, I said, Mark, it's Clyde. And uh, there's our church with the for sale sign out front in the newspaper. That's called photojournalism. The rumors all around town were that Adventist church burned their own church to get the insurance money to build a new one. Uh, yeah. Had a businessman say, I don't mean to offend you, but how much did it cost to have your church burned? You just did offend me. <laughs> I spent three hours being interrogated by two fire marshals. Yeah, it was rather interesting. I was taking death threats at the time. They told me to get my family out of town, but as a suspect, I couldn't leave town. They said, we will send sheriff's deputies past your house several times a night to check on your house. Interesting times. What happened to the church? Well, the church that was divided, you have to know our leadership, we had 12 elders. 
in the conflicts going on between when I got there and the fire, which was less than a year, we'd gone from 12 to nine elders. Some of them had just left, which was a good thing because now the church could grow. And then we got attacked from the outside and the church that was divided over a building program was no longer divided. The leader of the opposition to the new building was the leader, old building committee chair that built the first church. He walked up to me while the building was still smoking. And he said, I bought a semi to bring all those rocks and bricks in. He said, know anybody in the market for some used bricks? Then he looked at me, he said, young man, because he was a lot older than me. Young man, make sure it's a good, strong building committee. The church was now completely united behind a building program. Losing is winning when it turns you around. And the church had gone from 360 members down to about 330 members at this point. And from here, it began climbing even before we had a new church until a little bit after we had a new church, it had gone 360, 330 to 580. Amen. Losing can be winning. Now, God wasn't done with us. We had our groundbreaking. And we didn't have a groundbreaking with a couple of dignitaries with shovels. We had an old-fashioned horse-drawn plow with a bunch of ropes hooked up to it. And you get hundreds of people grabbing hold of those ropes, you wouldn't believe how fast that plow goes through the ground. Now, Maryland, especially this site, was a lot like Arkansas. It has a lot of rocks in the ground. And we had areas with rocks and areas without rocks. And I will tell you, my fear was we'd hit a rock with that plow. And with that many people pulling, I figured that old plow point would just snap and then people would go flying. And I didn't want to see that happen. And I'd gone through the route that we were going to pull the plow with a metal probe and make sure there were no rocks in the ground. <laughs> and because, man, it cut like butter through that ground with that many people pulling. And, uh, but groundbreaking was supposed to be on Sunday. On Tuesday morning, just a few days before, the fire marshal calls me. Oh, we'd gotten to know each other well in that year. And uh, he'd come and gone from my home many times. <laughs> and he calls me up and he says, uh, we're going to have a news conference tomorrow on Wednesday morning and we want you present. Okay. He said, you need to know we've got your, we've got your arsonist. We got him last night. And uh, I said, okay. And so I show up at the news conference. And he gives a brief explanation that this young man was stopped at a traffic stop the night before. And during the trial, I was not allowed to listen to the testimony because I am one of the witnesses. And the police arresting police officer is not allowed to listen to the testimony because he is a witness. And so we spent three days in the hallway together <sighs> for, during that trial. <laughs> now, you can't be in the courtroom together, but you can be in the hallway together. So we had all the time in the world if we wanted to coordinate our stories. But that's the way the system works. <laughs> And so I got to really get the background story of what happened on that Monday night before the news conference. This policeman is driving on a four-lane, one-way road down near Washington, D.C. And there's a moped going the wrong way coming at him. He stops the guy, young man in his 20s, mid-20s. And he says, may I see your driver's license? And he pulls out his wallet and hands it to the police officer. The whole wallet. 
Police officers would much rather have your driver's license. The officer opens it up carefully, and inside there are a bunch of pictures of little boys with no clothes on. The officer looks at the man and the pictures. Uh, the little boys are black boys, and the man is a white man. He said, who are these boys? Oh, those are my boys. Your boys? Yeah, those are my boys. OK. Officer says, hey, you're not under arrest or anything. He said, but how about we just throw your moped in the back of my cruiser in the trunk, and let's go down to the station, and let's have some coffee and donuts, and let's just talk for a while. The guy says, OK. They go down to the st on the way to the station, and the police officer does something that he says he always does when he's got somebody in the car. He says, what's your favorite radio station? Oh, it's a heavy rock station, heavy metal station. He tunes into it. And as they're driving and the radio's playing, he says, if I can get their music playing, they're more likely to talk to me. So the officer will put up with whatever music to get him to talk. <laughs> he says, what's your favorite group? Oh, that's Guns N' Roses. What's your favorite album? Death and Destruction. But I lost my Death and Destruction tape in a church fire up in Hagerstown. <laughs> oh, you did, huh? Tell me about it. So he did. He got to the police station, and the officer says, I remember hearing about a year ago about a fire in Hagerstown, <laughs> which is about 70 miles away from where the arrest is happening, because it was about to be an arrest. <laughs> and uh, he checked, and sure enough, it matches. They've got the fingerprints of somebody that's not been arrested before, so they don't know who it is, but they do the fingerprints of this guy, and yeah there's a match. This is on Tuesday. There is a news conference on Wednesday. And this fire marshal is a goofy guy. I mean, his buddies even give him a hard time over this. <laughs> But he gives a little bit of information that we've arrested him, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And he says, if you have any more questions, please talk to Pastor Rosenberg. And he does an about face. There's a door behind him, and he's gone. <laughs> and I'm sitting there on the front row, and I stand up and say, OK. Uh, he didn't tell me he was handing off a news conference with the television and the newspapers and all the rest of the media there. So I wasn't exactly ready for this. but. Arsonist is arrested, and they look at me, and they say, so how's your church doing? I said, well, our groundbreaking is on Sunday, and I start telling how our church is doing. We've been actually doing wonderful. We're united. We're solid. We're growing in Christ. We're growing in numbers. And the headline news story, arson arrested, groundbreaking on Sunday. What a way to clear your name in the community. It was awesome. How did the Lord get a divided church to be united and grow the 580? He had to take us through a loss to get us there. What's he going to do in your life? Don't be surprised if you face some losses on the way to get you the win. It happens all the time. Then there's the story of Allison. Allison was one of my church members she moved in to live with her brother and his wife. She's pregnant. It's going to be a single mom. We live in Hagerstown, Maryland, but she's getting her prenatal care at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. I knew why, but nobody else in the church did, other than her brother and sister-in-law. Allison 
in the early 1990s is an HIV patient. She'd done a lot of drugs and alcohol and promiscuous living. She was a risk taker and she was paying the price. But she's going to Johns Hopkins in the hope that they can save a baby from HIV. This is early on. And it's so early on that there was a real fear that she would be rejected by a church and community if they knew. This is the days of Ryan White, if you can remember those days, when somebody with a blood transfusion gets HIV is not allowed to go to school. And so I told her, when you're ready, we'll tell our congregation. Eventually that day came, and our congregation rallied around her, Amen. especially when they realized that as an HIV patient, her immune system was compromised. And she was the one at greater risk from us than we were from her every time she came to church. And they rallied around her and her young boy who successfully did not have HIV. I was at camp meeting and I had Allison come out to camp meeting. I was doing early teens and I asked her to share about her experience. The kids did not know she was an HIV patient. And she and her child were sitting on the floor and some of the kids were playing with her before the meeting began. And when the meeting began, we had our song service and I asked her to share, tell her story. And she says, I don't mean, I don't want you to misunderstand, but I'm an HIV patient and I'm glad I have HIV. She says, because if I hadn't got HIV, I wouldn't have given my life to Jesus Christ and I wouldn't live forever. And she describes what she's up against and how her little boy is clean. And uh, then we let the kids ask questions. A little young lady, teenager, raises her hand, but, but you and your son are so nice. She'd just been playing with them before. Yeah. It was a real eye-opener for these kids. But her statement is what's always stuck with me. I'm glad I have HIV because now I'm going to live forever. Amen. Now what God did for her is she ended up moving in with the doctor's family. The purpose was the doctor's family was willing to adopt her son. They would make sure that she had the best care possible as long as possible. And when she died, the little boy would not have to move. He was already in his new home. And that's what happened. God took care of that part for her as well. Because that was her biggest concern was her little boy. Losing is winning when it turns you around. How does God prepare his church for the loud cry in his coming? <laughs> Ever heard of the shaking? Well, I think we're already headed into it. Losing is winning when it turns you around. Keep that in mind. That's what he did in the Old Testament for his people. That's what he's doing now. You look at Daniel 11, you go into a worldwide conflict and then you have the loud cry. God gets everyone's attention, shakes it up, and they're open to listen to the gospel. And only then does the judgment end. God cares so much about you and your family that he's not going to close the judgment without a warning on this earth. He's going to have a wake-up call first. Isn't that awesome good news? I know I've got two boys that aren't living completely following Jesus Christ. And they're both paying real attention because they keep saying, Dad, that stuff you talk about keeps happening. They both know history well. They cannot get away from it. Praise the Lord. 
It's constantly going in their heads. And as I shared in Sabbath school, my youngest son, 22 years of age, at the lumber mill that he works in during break, somebody asked him about what's going on in the world. Do you have any ideas? And he goes, yeah. And he gives basically a prophecy seminar during break. He's trying not to believe it, but he's sharing it. <laughs> God is so good. Yeah. Remember, losing to win as we go through some very interesting times. God is so good. Amen. You know, Jerusalem gets caught in the middle, but so does the day of worship. The king of the north, the papacy, changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. The king of the south changed it from Sabbath to Friday. If you're a Sabbath keeper, where are you caught? In the middle. In the middle. It doesn't matter where in the world you go. And the allies to Islam are atheistic secularism, Marxist socialism, however you want to say it. And you're going to be attacked by either the King of the South Alliance or the King of the North Alliance if you're following Jesus. Just remember, losing is winning when it turns you around. God is going to put us through the process a refiner's fire. Do you want to go home? Yeah. So, don't be so fearful of the process. Just follow Jesus. He will take you through it. You don't have to live in fear. This is the opening to share the gospel like never before. We are entering the greatest evangelistic opportunity of all time. Ellen White says, when this final great increase of information happens, Daniel will go to the world as never before. As never before? During the Millerite movement, that was explosive. It's going to be better than that. How explosive? Somebody ran a joke advertisement, a little classified in the Washington, D.C. newspaper, that said William Miller would be on the steps of the Capitol at a certain time on a certain date. William Miller wasn't even in the area. It was just somebody's practical joke. Thousands of people showed up to hear him. It's going to be better than that. And I think we're on the edges of it beginning to happen. Already, hundreds of thousands of Muslims are having dreams and visions of Jesus, telling them to follow him as their savior and his book, the Bible, as their authority for life. I have a friend that runs a website answering Muslims' questions that have had dreams and visions of Isa, Isa Jesus, the righteous one, the man in white. I can't say where he lives or his name because he would instantly be up on an assassination list from the radical Muslims. That's already the kind of world we're living in. It's kind of interesting. Jesus, I believe, could be coming very soon. Because this will be the greatest evangelistic opportunity of all time. I have absolutely no question of it. God's word and spirit of prophecy both say so. So I'm expecting it and expecting it soon. We have polarized politics in our world. We have a struggling economy. Divided churches, which is the shaking. Hey, everything's coming along. It's time to take Jesus and the Bible very seriously. Romans says, now it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. In other words, get really serious about following Jesus. Those besetting sins, you really don't want to take them with you into the next step. You want to leave them behind. 
Let us walk properly as in in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Let Jesus through the Spirit cleanse your life. It's time. Ellen White said it this way, the third angel's message is swelling into a loud cry. And you must not feel at liberty to neglect the present duty and still entertain the idea that at some future time you will be the recipient of great blessing when without any effort on your part a wonderful revival will take place. Today you are to give yourself to God that you may be emptied of self, emptied of envy, jealousy, evil surmising, strife, everything that shall be dishonoring to God. Hey, that's saying the same thing Romans said, isn't it? It's time to be serious. Share with other people. Jesus said, if you acknowledge before me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father. If you don't acknowledge me before men, he said, I will not acknowledge you before my Father. Don't hide what you believe. If you're successful, you really lose big time. Because Jesus won't know you. I once lived out in the hills near Huntsville. And I had a neighbor move in who happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And they had their idea that they were going to have a time of trouble hideaway. They even had a little bomb shelter built in their place. Root cellar bomb shelter combination. Oh, they were ready. I decided to pay them a visit. Knock, Yeah. I said, hi, I, I just need to talk to you for a little bit. Uh, you, you're really setting up a, a situation out here where you've got a time of trouble hideaway, right? Yeah. I said, well, I'm here to tell you it's not going to work. What do you mean? Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before the Father. If you don't acknowledge me before men, I will not acknowledge you before the Father. So, To be successful out here, to hide, you're not going to be able to tell anybody what you believe. And if you're successful in that, Jesus won't know you when he comes. So that's not going to work out well. Besides, you have me for a neighbor. I'm telling everybody what I know what I believe. I'm inviting to my, my house to become friends with them. And if they get mad, they're going to know exactly where I live. And when they come looking for me, they're going to find you. (laughs) I said, so it's not going to work to hide up here. They sold their place. (laughs) You can't hide and be successful for Jesus. You've got to be a lamp on top of a lampstand, not under a bushel. Get over your hiding ideas. Enjoy loving people for Jesus. It is a joy. It's so much fun when you connect with people for Jesus Christ. And I don't want any of you to miss out on it. I'd even invite you to make sure you're here in the evenings because there are people looking for Jesus and looking for truth. And you can sit at the meals and get to know them and have fun with me. It is a joy. Jesus said that your joy may be full. Following him's not doom and gloom, it's joy. Losing is winning when it turns you around. Just always keep that in mind. We're going to sing a hymn as we close and more about Jesus. Man, let's constantly be learning more about Jesus and sharing more about Jesus with everybody around us. And uh, I think I invite you to stand. And Pastor, please turn off my mic so I can sing.